Today, I would like to welcome Brad Heath. Brad is um, a reporter with Reuters. Um, he was also on the investigative team at USA Today. He also ran the justice team for, like during the whole Mueller investigation. Um, he had, he's on the Virginia Bar, um, and he is kind of a unicorn in that he is both a, I will say, a genius, having worked with him, <laughs> and someone who's just incredibly nice and generous. Um, with his time and expertise. So when I sent that survey out to you all, um, and thank you, by the way, for completing that, um, the number one kind of uh, you know technical skill that you were all interested in was PACER. And so Brad is an expert in PACER. He's going to go through it today. Um, same deal as before, you know, we want this to be useful to you. So he's going to go through, and then we're going to open it up um, for questions from you all, um, feel free to get specific, general, whatever. And um, yeah, all right, Brad, take it away. Good morning. Um, so just as an initial thing, like PACER, backgrounding, use of court records is a capacious subject. There will be a lot I don't cover. So all my contact information is up there. If there are questions we can't cover in the next hour, um, send them to me and I will do my best to help you out. Um, and if you have questions as we're going, just let me know. And, and what I really hope you will be able to ask is like what, what you want to know about this. So I'm going to try to hit the highlights of how this thing works and what tools you might be able to use. Uh, and then I'm curious what, what particular things you want to be able to, to do that you can't now. Um, so PACER, for those of you who don't know, is the website of the federal court system. It's actually like 96 different websites duct taped together in crazy ways. They were built in the 90s, I think, and look like it. Um, it it's, it's crazy. But it is really, really effective. And you can search cases in the federal courts back to a little before 2000, depending on the district you're in. And unlike a lot of court systems you might have played with online before, you get everything. You can see all the documents. You can see all the docket text. Uh, it is at your fingertips. Um, and, and it is really handy for getting filings from anywhere whenever you want them. Um, the other thing PACER has is the federal bankruptcy system, because those are run out of federal courts. And everybody overlooks this part of PACER, but it is awesome especially as you're getting into backgrounding people um, because the detail that gets provided in a bankruptcy case is just astonishing. Um, you know, it's, it's basically all your money, everybody you owe money to, everybody who owes money to you, all the people who are mad at you, what they're mad at you about. Uh, like the, the records will go on for thousands and thousands of pages. You can get all the thousands and thousands of pages. And if you really want to dive on somebody, uh, definitely see if they have been a party to a bankruptcy proceeding. Um, the other thing you can do in PACER, at least in some places, is get real-time alerts when new things happen. So there are a lot of cases, obviously, in D.C. that are of interest. There's January 6th defendants. There's all the litigation between the J6 committee and the former president and the people around the former president. Um, there, there's all sorts of challenges to... Biden regulatory policies, like whatever your thing is, the in some districts, and DC is one of them, you can sign up to get, as a, as a journalist, to get the same kind of alerts that the lawyers get whenever something new is filed in the case. It just sends you an email with what this thing is and you know click the button to see the document. Uh, it's phenomenal and it's how people get legal news on Twitter and everything else within about three seconds. Um, and then the other, the other cool thing I like about Pacer is just you never know what you're going to find. Uh, if you if you just start scrolling around in there or querying the courts for like what happened today, you will find bizarre cases of the government suing weird things because it's trying to seize them. So what is this one like? Uh, a ton of United States gold, which I think they found in this like cave in West Virginia. I mean, it, it was a whole saga. Um, but sometimes you just see things that are weird and interesting that will be worth a half hour of your time to to look at. Um, PACER is, for all that goodness, highly limited. Uh, so you're going to pay 10 cents a page. Page is sort of funny in the digital space. Usually it's capped at like three bucks. Um, 
it is well worth it. So, and hopefully a lot of you work at places where they're gonna reimburse you. If you are a low mileage Pacer user and have your own account, I think they still don't bill you if you're under, if you're only using it a little bit. I don't know what the cutoff is. I've never been close to that cutoff. I use it a lot. Uh, so, and, and it is only federal courts, which are this tiny sliver at the top of the US legal system, right? And, and it's not even every federal court because the Supreme Court has to be different and has its own docketing system that is ugly and awful. And unless you cover the court, I encourage you not to pay any attention to it. Um, and the, the one other thing that kind of drives me crazy is the search is really limited. You know, if you, you have to know what you want. You have to know the name of the person who's being sued that you're interested in. You can kind of do reports sometimes to say, show me like the FOIA cases in DC uh, or show me what's been filed in the past week. But really you have to come in the door with some idea of what it is you want. You, you know, there are other tools out there that will let you search within the text of a document to say, you know, show me all the things where they're alleging medical malpractice involving this particular device and blah, blah, blah. Like Pacer will not do that for you. Uh, so you'll, you'll find it's like great up to a point and then the limitations of it get really, really frustrating when it comes to, comes to trying to dig deeper. So the easiest starting point for Pacer, because it is all these sites glued together, is what's called the party case locator. Um, so the address is up there, pcl.uscourts.gov. Uh, and if you log into Pacer, you will see, let's see, a site that looks something like this, uh, which gives you all the various ways you can search for things. The one, basically all, the only one of these I ever use is the advanced find parties. That's what lets you search by, you know, in, in court, a party is a person or a business that's one of the, one of the entities on one side of the lawsuit. Uh, and that gets you to this search, which gives you access to the nationwide index of federal court cases. And you can get from here into basically everything. The, this won't give you, like if somebody's arrested this morning, it's going to take a little while for their name to get into the national index. I, I don't know what the lag is, but there is a lag. And Pacer has gotten weirder and laggier uh, ever since there were some security vulnerabilities in the court systems docketing that caused them to, the clerks to do crazy stuff. Um, but this is how you go find a person who's involved in a lawsuit. My favorite, Stephen Bannon. Um, I wonder if, and you can just put in the first and last name and search. You can do a date range. You can add the status. Um, let's see if we can, we'll make him just criminal case. Did I mention it's a great website? <laughs> can, you, can you search somebody if, they've, if they're suing initially without their name attached and then it's unsealed? Or... So if it's like a John Doe? Specifically Dan Scavino when he, was, he sued the January 6th committee about his records, but it was, right. it was without his name and then the judge, I think, unsealed it. Yeah, so the judge, I think they would have put him in as a party. Okay. So at some point, Whenever the clerk got around to carrying out that order, he should have been added to the case as a party, and you should then be able to search him. Yeah. Is there any way to track when a new party files an initial lawsuit? Because I used to work at Law 360, so I spent a lot of time here and yeah. tracking cases that have already been filed. Like once I get like the press release from ACLU, like we're suing over this, and then I can like obviously like make my ECF account center for the case. But it, I'd like to be able to know when somebody files a new suit without someone having to send me a press release about it. Is there any way to track? Like, I want to know every time the ACLU files a new lawsuit in the Southern District of Texas, like 50 50 it's immigration. Like. I mean, the short answer to that is yes, but not through PACER. Okay. <laughs> um, there, there are third party services that will let you do things like that. Um, I think a site called Scoop, S Q O O P, would let you do it. Um, I, we we have something we use internally that's mining data feeds out of the courts to look for some things like that. So you can you can definitely build it. It doesn't work nationwide because like and Scoop does the same thing as it mines those feeds, but only like seventy four of the ninety odd districts have turned those on. So you'll miss a bunch. Um, and then 
LexisNexis and Westlaw, and I think I'm under a corporate duty to plug Westlaw, um, so subscribe to Westlaw, um, will also allow you to run reports like that and to be alerted when a party shows up in something new. Okay. But, but Pacer, no. Okay. Uh, what you can do in Pacer is just, a lot of people do this now, go, go in and query all the cases filed in a district on a particular day or over the past week and just scan through there. And I mean, that's where you find the truly wonderful Pacer debris anyway, but it is a little bit of investment of your time. It's where you find search warrants too, which is excellent. I mean, if you if you don't follow like Seamus Hughes, uh, who's over at GW, who just every day is finding new public corruption scandals by somebody forgot to seal a search warrant application. Um, they, it, it's a great source of just finding stuff you don't expect. As an aside, Seamus is actually going to sp be speaking to us later this year. So. Outstanding. Yeah. <laughs> well, then I'm done here. <laughs> no, no, keep going. Keep going. So I don't, I don't know why this is not letting me search this boy or logging me out all the time. Let me try it once more. Here we go. So uh, I searched just Stephen Bannon nationally. Oh, you guys are still seeing my presentation. There we go. Um, and lo and behold, there are a bunch of cases for him, total of 17. And you'll see a bunch of different information. So like here is the party who came up relative to the search. Um, our Stephen Bannon is K, but how you end up in this, if, like if you're being sued, is really up to the person suing you. So he could also be Steve. Um, the, the clerks are not like standardizing this. They are just typing in what's on the face of the lawsuit. Um, Next, you will see the case number. And the case number contains one really interesting detail, uh, which is there's two letters smushed in the middle of it. Uh, the two you'll see the most are CR, criminal case, he's got some, and CV, the civil case, he's suing or somebody's suing him. And then there are some other BK, bankruptcy, um, MJ, like a, a lower level criminal proceeding. Um, tells you what court it's in, tells you when it was filed, tells you when it was closed. When it was closed is kind of neat to know because you'll see down here where it's blank. That means there are still some cases going on involving him. And let's see, I'm going to look for the CR. So here's a pending CR case because he is currently indicted in the District of Columbia. If you click it, you will go into the DC uh, PACER site. And then the one I always use to get details on the case is the docket report. So you click that, click run report, and here is everything to know. So we've got the defendant, Stephen Bannon. We've got information about his counsel over here. Um, we've got what he's charged with. If he'd been convicted, acquitted, whatever, it'll say how it came out, what he was sentenced to. Um, Oh, here's the press coalition. Uh, here's the information for the prosecutors in the case. What's really kind of neat is sometimes these are direct phone numbers that don't go to the switchboard and people just pick up and they're not supposed to talk to you, but once in a while they do. So um, fun. Uh, and then below that, you get basically all the information in the case that's been filed with the court and you get it in order. Uh, so the documents do you guys have much experience looking at cases great and small sort of um sorry people are trying to sell me a subaru um <laughs> the the things you really want to look at when you look at a case for the first time are generally the first things in the docket i'm not gonna buy a subaru go away um so in a criminal case you'll see a complaint an information, an indictment, something like that, that says, here's what we think happened. In a civil case, you'll generally see a complaint. That's gonna lay out the broad strokes of what this thing is all about. And then as you go down, you will go much more into the weeds about motions and scheduling. And if you go all the way to the end, you might see the judgment that says what the ultimate resolution of this case was, but he's still pending. Um, and then I, my screen has a bunch of these weird blue icons which are, do you guys know what recap is? 
Okay. Well, I'll come to recap in a couple minutes. Um, recap is great. So, I mean, that's the gist of searching for somebody on Pacer. Seems easy. Any questions? Cool. Let's see if I can go back to this. Okay. I guess we will come to recap. So, Pacer is the you know the government source of all of this, and there are a lot of providers then that take this information and try to lay their own stuff on top of it. Um, the one that I kind of think is best is a site called Court Listener, which is part of the Free Law Project, and they just ingest millions and millions of records from Pacer and put them up in a place that's free, uh, so you can search it. And those little blue icons that I saw when I was looking around in Pacer means I have put a browser extension on called Recap, R-E-C-A-P. Uh, and what Recap does is whenever I or you go and buy a document from Pacer, it sends a copy of that out to the Free Law Project where then it becomes free for everybody else. So if you have it installed, you're sharing with the world, and then when you pull up a report, you know, a docket report, you'll see those blue icons. You can click that to see the document at no charge. Um, the other cool thing about Court Listener is it allows you to set up docket alerts uh, outside of Pacer. So there are some districts that don't allow you to subscribe to get the real time alerts. Court Listener will, and anytime it finds something new in the case, it will send you an email. Um, I think you can follow like 10 cases at a time. Um, more maybe if you if you install the browser extension. Um, but it's also, it makes them fully searchable. So then if you want to say, you know, one thing I, I really wanted to pay attention to after the January 6th siege was what kind of language did the Justice Department use to describe the conduct of the people who were charged that day? Was it a riot? Was it a siege? Was it an insurrection? Was it a revolt? Was it... An, you can't tell that just by looking at Pacer, right? You have to read everything. But it, you could, on Court Listener, you can set up alerts and say, find me cases that use this really specific language, like insurrection um, or, you know, overthrow or something like that. And when it detects a new one that's got the word in the middle someplace, it will send you an email to say, hey, I found something. Uh, and that's super handy. And if there are topics you're interested in or a rule you're following, um, it, it's not as, the coverage isn't as good. Not everything gets put up there, but a lot of things do, especially in high profile cases that people are paying attention to. Um, and the other thing that it does well is it has access to a bunch of state court opinions. So not usually the state trial courts, but usually the, the intermediate and final appellate courts. So you'll at least get some visibility into what's going on in state court there. Um, and the, the website is here, courtlistener.com slash recap. You can just go and search and see what happens. It's a fairly easy site to use. I can show you if anybody wants, but um, it is super intuitive. Um, the other one I mentioned before, Scoop, which is sort of designed to set up really to follow companies uh, but it mines data feeds out of the federal court. So I think you can look for if, you know, if my company is involved in new litigation, give me an alert for that. Update me on its pending litigation. I think it does SEC filings, too. Uh, it's not totally comprehensive, but it, it's pretty handy. Pacer Pro does something similar where, you know, they're, they're really just adding their own service on top of Pacer. You can set it up with your account so it'll go check the case for you every hour or something like that. You will, you will eat the charges for that, so just be aware. Um, the one I really, really like and don't actually have access to anymore is a site called Courtlink, which is a LexisNexis product. Uh, if you have access to it, great. Um, I remember playing with it a couple of times and like I'm about to submit a search and it says this search would be $300, um, but your price is zero. I felt so good. Uh, so if you have access to it, I mean, it's phenomenal because it, it unlike any other site I've ever seen, will let you search within the text of a huge body of state and federal court documents. So if you're looking for information on somebody or on a subject or whatever, it would always go there. I mean, we, we used it a ton in investigations actually to say, okay, you know, we've, we've documented this problem with a particular medical device uh, or with a particular doctor. So let's now search all the court documents we can find to see 
what comes up with that text in it somewhere, even if they're not named as a party. It's super helpful uh, and super expensive. Uh, so, so that's kind of like my top crust of the federal court system uh, overview. And then the other thing I heard you guys were interested in is, is taking that and using it for backgrounding more broadly. Uh, and, and backgrounding, really expansive topic, really hard to do. And frankly, the better you get at it, the more frustrating and difficult it becomes because you'll start to be aware of like how much is missing and you know what the, the limits of what you're able to do. Uh, but there are, this then starts to sweep in a lot of additional types of information that you want, might want to learn about a person. Um, and there are a lot of, a lot of sites out there that give you a good starting point for this. So there's Westlaw, again, plug, uh, Accurant, TLO, and LexisNexis. I mean, do you guys generally have access to these things? Some or all of these things? Okay. Um, my starting point tends to be LexisNexis. Um, and I will, we'll do a search in a second. Um, but there, there's a lot to kind of be aware of with these broad search sites because they are, they are trying to ingest the universe of data, right? Like anything and everything about any person anywhere. Uh, and they're, so they're taking headers off credit reports. They're pulling voter registration. They're pulling licenses. They're pulling, um, court records, prison records, police records, uh, basically anything you can, there's a lot of property transfers, um, anything you can think of that might have names in it, they are trying to get, and they are in a sort of ugly way trying to smush together to say, you know, this information is about me, Brad Heath, versus the other Brad Heath who lives 10 miles down the road. And I mean, you do learn quickly in these sites how, even if you think someone has an uncommon name, like they really don't. Um, so... But it's important to know at the outset with these that a lot of what you will see when you look at them is wrong. It's either out of date, it's just totally wrong and doesn't make any sense at all. It's information that actually belongs to another person that they've somehow crossed the wires. Um, and you know, this is the sort of thing that you can reuse really only as a tip sheet like you should never print something that says according to alexis search you know so and so lives at this address like don't do it um but it does give you a good enough start uh and the one thing it does really well is cell phone numbers like sometimes you'll get six cell phone numbers per person but uh one of my very favorite things is to just call officials on their cell phone and then they ask how did you get this number and but it's always fun. Um, I do it with cops a lot, so it's like the same way you do, man. Uh, but if you really, if you have access to these things and you want to sort of calibrate how good or bad is this, search for yourself. Like until about a year ago, my current address where I've lived for seven years did not come up. Uh, none of my current cell phone numbers come up, including the ones like listed on my Twitter bio and that I put on everything and have for, I mean, 16 years. Um, you know, it doesn't come up with my professional license, even though it really should. Um, it does come up with a deed. Like, it, I mean, it's shockingly bad and it comes up with a bunch of email addresses, like not one of which is mine or ever has been. Uh, so, if you do that, you will start to get a sense of what you can trust, maybe what you can't trust, uh, and you'll you'll read, you'll be a more educated reader of these reports. Uh, so we can actually try one. So the way I get into this, if you guys have, this is nexus.com, um, public records up at the top. I think it's part of the basic subscription. And the, the interface, I mean, I found when I changed jobs that the Nexus interface changed too with a different subscription. So the actual buttons you click can be different. Uh, but the one I always go to is the SmartLink comprehensive report, uh, which lets you search by a variety of different criteria. And it is kind of neat that you can do things like um, you can specify an age range here if you're going to put in an address. Like I think this person lives in Northern Virginia, but uh, you could say within 30 miles of Arlington which will get you a lot of the DC suburbs. 
Uh, that stuff is super handy. Uh, we'll try Steve Bannon again, who I think lives in New York. And let's say that's all we know. And then we'll, what we'll get is sort of a, a summary of everybody who comes back. So there are a bunch of Steve Bannons. Um, first cut is usually age. I don't think he's 57, but I could be wrong. Um, here's a Stephen K. Bannon. I know K is right. Um, so it gives me sort of over here what it thinks of as the addresses. Uh, it's giving me a partial guess as to a social security number, but it's not going to show you the whole thing. It's frustrating. Uh, and then if you click through here, you will eventually get a fairly comprehensive report. Uh, I don't know if you guys can read all this, but the point of this is not to show you where Steve Bannon lives, but that you can see, you know, It'll give you a summary. It'll give you addresses. Here's his voter registration, um, real property records, judgments and liens. So has somebody, you know what a lien is? Somebody files it against your property because you owe money. Um, those are great. Like federal tax liens will tell you who's not paying their taxes. State tax liens, same thing. Those actually do show up here pretty well. Uh, and they're hard to search for in other ways. Um, What's interesting here is if you come down to criminal filings, so here we see a traffic ticket involving Steve Bannon in Los Angeles, it looks like. Um, Steve Bannon has been twice indicted in the federal system. LexisNexis is a huge consumer of federal court data. It has not managed to put two and two together on him. So there, this is a massive understatement of Steve Bannon's criminal liability. Uh, and this is the one I like, you know, cell phones. So it's going to give you a couple different versions based on whatever records it's pulled. I don't actually know which one is right. I've never called him. Um, you're welcome to try. But generally what I'll do is if I see the same number more than once, that's the one I'll call first. Um, and then I will call the rest until somebody gets mad at me and says that they are Steve Bannon. Um, and this whole thing you can export or, or whatever. The other interesting one here is, let's see, do we have um, potential relatives? Um, so for example, if you're looking for somebody, this works especially well with young people. Uh, if you can't find them because there's no phone number, there's a reasonable chance you can find their mom. Their mom will probably talk to you when they call. Their mom will probably get you to get that person to call you. Um, so it's like call people's moms. Uh, it's gonna get you guys in a lot of trouble. How do you, how do you check the voter registration? Like it said, they reported. The yeah. So, well, let's see what they've pulled. So, we've got a voter, like a New York voter registration. They have varying degrees of detail. So, this one says it was a 2016 registration. Uh, there's a Florida voter registration. Another Florida voter registration, 2014 and another Florida voter registration. I think that's just when, it's one of the things that with Nexus and with all these sites that's super frustrating is you never exactly know where they're pulling this. Like you, there's a thing you can click for sources and it will just say like voter registration. Mm -hmm. It is not helpful. Um, so I think what they're doing with this is they get a copy of the state voter file and they say, okay, we have, you know, Steve Bannon in here. So that's a voter registration. And then maybe they do it again a couple of years later and like there's Steve Bannon again, and here he is. Um, so if you look up yourself, you'll probably see a couple voter registrations at the same address. Like you haven't moved, nothing has changed, but you'll be in there a couple of times. And then there'll be times like, I don't think they have my voter registration. I'm registered to vote in Virginia and have been since 2006 and just whatever, they don't have it. Um, so one of the things, um, I'll jump ahead a little bit, but the, that's really useful about this site is you can kind of place this person geographically, right? You can say, okay, Steve Bannon seems to be in New York. Steve Bannon seems to be in Miami, maybe Sarasota. You can't really report that he's a registered Republican based on LexisNexis. 
But if you know he's in New York, you can figure out who holds the voter registration records for New York, right? Uh, and then you can go get the actual records. And if you know he's in New York, you can say, okay, now I know where to go to search property transfers, right? Because all of the New York City property transactions are online. And basically that's true everywhere. Uh, or at least in any large county, you should be able to go search deeds and liens and all that now. Um, the local court system could well be online in a way that is invisible to LexisNexis, right? Like if, if somebody has a case out in Fairfax County, Virginia, LexisNexis, Westlaw probably won't know about it, but you can go to the Fairfax County site. I think you have to sign up and register. Like most of them make you register. I have so many local court passwords that I might as well have none. Um, but that's the authoritative source that lets you dig in. That, that's where you go to find the bits in your background that are missing, the bits that you want to confirm to be able to make them reportable. And then you'll have a piece of paper. And truthfully, like the knowing the existence of a case or a transfer is far less interesting than knowing the details of it, right? You want to see if there was a criminal case, like what was he charged with? If it was a speeding ticket, was he going 40 over or 20 over? Like, did he mouth off to the cop or not? That could well be in there. Um, did he plead? Did he fight it? I don't know. Uh, you know, that that's the flavor of stuff you want. And the more, the more you know about a person, even just their address, the more doors will be open to you to learn still more about them, right? And it, what you do then depends on what you want to know about the person and how deep you want to go. You know, do you want to drop a FOIA to the local sheriff and say, give me every jail booking involving this person, right? Has he ever been in the jail? Uh, do you want to drop one to the county 911 center and say, give me a record of any 911 dispatch to that property? Uh, we do that with some regularity for certain types of background checks. Uh, do you want the recordings of those 911 calls? Do you want body camera footage from any stops involving him? You know, the, the more you know, the more you can get. You know, when, if you pull the, the deeds to property, you'll see who else is signing it. You might see the details of their mortgage. Uh, you know, we, we did a lot of that with Mike Flynn uh, last year just to see, you know, it, it just seemed like the guy should be making money. Uh, and maybe he's paying off his mortgages. Like, what, what are the visible signs of somebody making money? So we went to get what county he was in in Rhode Island and got all the deeds. And whenever you refinance a house or pay down a mortgage, that gets recorded with the county clerk and you can get them. So, you know, the, it, and, and then it just becomes this thing of one door opens another door, opens another door. And before you know it, you can come up with a really comprehensive picture of at least some section of a person's life. That actually does cover most of what I wanted to cover with you guys. Um, the you know the the best backgrounding sources are going to be those local websites that you know you, you take the national search and that's your guide to which local websites to search. But there really aren't a ton of great repositories out there that just let you do this and be done. Uh, sadly, um, so I mean. It, with that, I'm curious to know like, what you guys want to know about how these systems work, how they work together, how they don't work, or, or what it is you want to achieve so that maybe we can help get you there. I'm going to be selfish and ask about my situation. Sure. But like, I'm a regional reporter, and I cover very specific people and kind of very you know congressional delegation, very specified geographical area, right? What would you say? to a reporter who like, has that sort of beat about what's like the best bang for your buck. Because you can do pacer searches all day. Yes. Like, what's a good thing to get into either on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, that's like the best bang for your buck? I mean, are, are you looking to see like, are, is your delegation involved in litigation or? Not that we know of. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it wouldn't hurt you once in a while just to, and I can, I can show you how to do this. I mean, I generally think everybody should do this. Um, so you, it's harder to do it nationally. If I were just covering Washington as a regional correspondent, I would not do a daily pacer search every day because I, I mean, it, odds are 
that you will not break the news of a litigation involving a member of Congress by doing that. Like somebody else will have found it first because there are people who are just on the federal courts all day. That's not you. It shouldn't be you. Um, so you'll you'll probably see it on Twitter. But it, is, it, it might be worth looking to see what's going on. Um, you know, but if, if all you want to do is see, like, have they been sued? Weekly is probably more than sufficient. Um, I, I once, there were, like, years and years ago, Dennis Kucinich, when he was a member of Congress, I think he chipped a tooth or something on a olive at a local deli and he filed a lawsuit in dc superior court and somebody found it like they found it a week later and you know it was this minor insignificant nothing and i got it in my head that like we should never get beat on something like that again um and i tried to build this whole thing that would mine all the local court feeds and match them up against names of members of congress and like it was a shit show like it was it produced nothing of value um so I don't know. It's like, what's the, the, the game's not worth the candle. Yeah. Um, but I will show you how to run these just kind of regular checks uh, because they're good to be able to do. So the other way into Pacer is just pacer.gov, which shows you this awful menu of things. Um, so I'm going to go find a case by a specific court. And... Then I go down to the CMECF lookup, which will then give me a list of all the various federal courts. And we are in the District of Columbia District Court. Log in. And this takes me to an even uglier website, like this is the ugly side of PACER. Um, click this middle link to go into the filing system. And then up here at the top, in every district, Every district is laid out a little differently. Every district has a different background color. Some of them are awful. Uh, some of them are borderline unreadable. <laughs> query. And query gives you different and maybe better tools. So you can go and look at like what type of case. I want to keep track of all the FOIA cases. You know, uh, I want to keep track of all the, I think you can look for APA cases, things that things nobody pays attention to. Um, but you can do the date file. So today is the seventh. We'll do um, anything filed between March first and March seventh. Run the query, and then just for your reference, this came out to three pages. It cost thirty cents. So the more you do it, the more you're going to pay. Uh, but then you get this list of like everything that's been filed. So here are some criminal cases up here. Um, here are some civil cases. And you can just go through an eyeball. And DC is not great at this, but in other districts, if you do this, you'll see like search warrant applications. You'll see crazy stuff down in Texas, like the government is suing some guy's house because they want to take it so they can build a border wall there. Um, they're suing some quantity of money because a dog got curious and started sniffing it. Uh, you know, there, there's just all sorts of crazy stuff that's in here. But if you do this once a week, you will have a reasonably good idea of what's going on. And then anything you decide you're curious about, um, I don't know, this one, for example, uh, you can go in the same way, view the docket report, and see what's going on. And if it's a new case, not a lot will be going on. Yeah. I have a quick question. Um, my name is Rachel, and I'm at Stack. Um, okay. I cover like lobbying, a lot of corporate and lawsuits. Yeah. I wonder, have you had much success like petitioning when certain documents are sealed or arguing for the out? And how do you process? Um. Yes and no. Uh, the effective way to do that is to get counsel to do it uh, and, and like intervene. You, you'll see that. I mean, we saw that in the, the Bannon case where there are like a coalition of media interveners that are showing up for the purpose of unsealing particular documents. That's expensive. That's a whole lot of organizing. I've been involved in a couple of them. Like it takes a while to wind up the system to do that. And it's got to be high profile. Um, I have occasionally 
written a letter to a judge and said, you know, this document seems to be sealed. The public has a right of access. I don't think you have satisfied, you know, on the record, the requirements for maintaining it under seal. I would like it to be unsealed. Um, it's worked a little bit. It does not work anywhere nearly as well as getting a partner from a Washington law firm to show up and pound the table. Um, but if you're curious, like I would be happy to share a copy of the letter. Um, so send me an email and I will send it to you and you can crib from it however you want. Is there an easier way to get transcripts um, hearings instead of waiting the 90 days for them to be uploaded to paper or physically like mailing a chassis and then waiting for their uh, yes, good question. Um, so in the federal courts, the court reporters are independent contractors. Uh, you can get a transcript very, very quickly. You call the judge's chambers and say, I want the number, the telephone number for the court reporter or the email. You contact that person and you pay them for the transcript and you'll, you'll pay them more to rush it. Um, but if you, if you want it, you know, sometimes it's 100 bucks, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, whatever it is, depending on the length of the, I think they do it by the word. Um, usually you can get it in a day or two uh, and you just vent, most of them take Venmo or um, PayPal. Um, so you send them the money, you get the transcript. Uh, or the other thing is, if it's something that's going to be appealed, um, then it's possible one of the lawyers on either side will have already ordered the transcript and maybe they'll give it to you. Um, you save money if you're not the first person to ask for it. But if you need it, you need it, you pay for it. That's how you get it. So I just want to make sure that I understand your advice to us. Um, so check Pacer with some regularity. Would it be, um, so, so for me, um, I should be checking DC and then the Western District of Pennsylvania. Yeah, you could. Well, I mean, do you have a federal courts reporter in Pittsburgh or someone who covers? He's, he's okay. Good, but I just want to practice for myself. Oh, yeah, then, yeah, yeah. then search both districts. And like the other thing you might see if we go back to this is like not a person, but an organization. You know, so imagine like a coal mining coalition or something like that that you'll see a lot of regulatory challenges filed in DC, those could well end up being more interesting and relevant to you than like an individual member of Congress because they they get sued sometimes for garbage reasons, they just go away. Um, but if they're setting up a big fight over some kind of rule that's, that broadly affects your community, then you very likely would see it, you know, it'll either be in DC or in the place where the rule is being applied and contested um, and those can those can be interesting stories, or those can be gateways to more interesting information. I'm just curious about as we've been scrolling through this, um, like right up on the screen right now, it's, there's someone suing ICE, Mayorkas, and the Department of Homeland Security. Um, when you look take a look at cases like that, like what's the usual difference in like someone's motive for specifically saying like the member of the cabinet? Or uh, sometimes it depends on what kind of relief you're getting. Uh, there are certain types of suits you have to file against a person. There are certain types you have to file against the government, depending on what you want to happen. And there are certain types where you just like throw everybody in there. And then often though, if you see like everybody, everybody in there, it's garbage. Like the person just doesn't know what they're doing. They probably don't have a lawyer. Um, but you know, it, uh, so I think it'll depend on the nature of the suit. Sometimes, um, let's go back in. Let's just see what this is. So there is some information up here about what's going on. Um, it, but it really says the nature is an other statutory action. Uh, so there's a couple plaintiffs. Uh, suing Mayorkas and suing USCIS. So the other thing in Pacer is it's going to show you the first, the first party usually, not like every party versus every party. So sometimes too, it's just a function of who's on the docket first. And the clerks are pretty literal about this. They like whoever you listed first, they list first. If you're really interested in Homeland Security or immigration, it's not a bad thing to maybe not read them all, but read some of them, because then you'll have a sense of like what people are fighting about, 
Um, and you'll start to see the lawyers who are involved in it. And those might be people you want to talk. You know, if you see the same lawyer four times in a row, well, maybe that's a person you want to talk to. Uh, maybe that's an expert or maybe that person just knows something that's going on that you want to find out. You sue the federal government a lot of times. It's like the overarching agency yeah. will be listed. So like the Department of Interior or like the Department of you know, Other Human Services. But there, someone's suing the sub agency. Like the incident happened with the sub agency. How yeah. do you go in and search and find where the name of the sub agency or cases against that sub agency if they're sort of the, the entirety, the, the overarching agency? Can you... Tell me what kind of case you're thinking of. Like you, you dented my car, or like you denied me citizenship, or you're like malpractice as a doctor, okay, like being a bad cop, like a bad ice right, or something. Okay, so I mean, those those get super complicated, right? And it, and what you search for will depend a lot on the type of case you're looking for. Um, the if you're looking for like medical malpractice we, we ran into this looking at the va you know those suits get filed against the va even though it's a va doctor who did something wrong the doctors i think enjoy some immunity um so you sue the va and the name of the doctor will show up in the complaint but you can't search for it i mean if you have court link you can search for the name of the doctor because it will be in the document uh and you can try it on court listener and you can try it on westlaw and between all those things, you can cobble together a picture, maybe. Um, there are other outlets for those sorts of things, too. Like if it's these come up with, uh, I mean, think about the, the postal service or something, right? Like they, they just get in a lot of car accidents. Um, so they drive a lot. Um, those there's a specific process within the government that you can't just sue the government. You have to go in and like file an administrative claim to say, fix my car. And then there's a whole other federal court that nobody talks about that's here in DC. That's the court of federal claims, which is where you go when like you think the government did you wrong and you want them to pay you money. Um, and that, that again, you can search on Pacer and just see like who's filing cases there. And it's, it's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of like the postal van ran over my foot, but, uh, there's also interesting stuff too. And, but then you also get into these weird areas of the law where, you know, an ICE agent shot me multiple times illegally. In that case, you have to sue the ICE agent by name and you don't sue ICE. ICE would not be a party to the case, uh, unless they chose to show up later somehow to defend it. So really you have to know how that type of case would be filed to know exactly where to look for it. So like if somebody did get shot by an ICE agent, like what would that look like? Basically? That would probably be the person or their estate versus the ICE agent. And would it say like Joe Smith with ICE or is it not necessarily. It might be just Joe Smith. Um, they're, they're difficult. Uh, some There might be a... There's another set of filters that we haven't talked about that's like the nature of the suit or the cause of action. Um, there are a ton of codes here. I don't play with them a lot. Uh, but like if you are suing a federal agent for violating your rights, that's a Bivens action. And you know, I don't, I don't know if there's a code in here for Bivens or not. Uh, there might be, or there might be a code for civil rights. They, they have lots of classifications. Sometimes, if a new issue comes up, that they're like, um, you know, we we know this is going to create a, a body of cases, and we want to be able to keep track of them somehow. They will create a new nature of suit for that. Um, so you you can play around with these fields in the query and see if there's something that helps you narrow it. I'm just wondering, you know, you post these really interesting cases on Twitter. What are your, like, rabbit hole searches that you do? Um, mine get, like, super rabbit holy. Um, I, you know, sometimes I just try to follow whatever the big case du jour is. 
Uh, you know, the January 6th litigation is super interesting to me because deep in these filings, weird stuff just dribbles out. And it's not, you know, it's not what the case is about. It's just like what people say along the way. Um, I do have a thing. Uh, Pacer throws off these data feeds in a lot of different districts. They're like, every time there's a new filing in a case, uh, it will, if you guys know what RSS feeds, they're RSS feeds. Um, it'll put a new item in the RSS. So you can, you can take those and you can set up a search on it and say, you know, I want to see these particular types of things. So like, I am super interested when it's United States versus some quantity of money, because those are always weird. Uh, United States versus somebody's property. Um, I'm super interested when something gets unsealed, especially if the case has been pending for a while. Um, one of my favorites is orders on motions to suppress, which is when you come into court and say the government did something illegally when they searched my house or like wiretapped me or whatever. So throw out the evidence. Um, but those are, you got to kind of build a thing to look at those. Uh, there's not an easy way. You might be able to rig up some kind of query in Courtlink uh, or Westlaw or Recap to get you close to that. Um, but I haven't tried, so I don't know. But you'll find the same stuff if you just do the what was filed in the past week. You know, you'll see it one district at a time, but it'll be everything. Is there any general advice you can give just about state court searches like this? And if whether they all do, it's just a lot less out there, like they're all just different? Or they're all different. Um, and some states, like Pennsylvania, is kind of okay because it has a unified judicial system and has one place where you go to query the entire state. Um, Maryland is like that. Virginia is not like that. New York has courts that are, I, I don't even know how to describe some of the New York courts. They, they don't have, the, the New York court where in the town where I went to college, the judge was the retired school bus driver and there was not a computer. Um, so it's, it's a little bit all over the map. Uh, you know, Los Angeles, in California, the systems are different for every county and some of them are really good and some of them are really bad and some of them call, like Los Angeles costs more than San Bernardino and you just have to wade through all those. But, you know, if you had, if you're a local court reporter, you should absolutely figure out how to do this in your local court. If you're a Washington reporter uh, trying to pay attention to the national government, that's a lot of investment for probably not a lot of news. So you go into sort of like, find a case, you go into sort of like, case summary to sort of get the breakdown of documents and you know see like looking for a complaint uh, yep. maybe like looking at the affidavit are there just some other documents that are housed in there you know maybe like dozens of them that are sort of like overlooked that could be really helpful uh yes um i like i'm a big fan of pretrial motions uh so there'll be like motions to suppress motions to dismiss motions to disqualify motions in limine that all come in and i mean it's basically a party showing up and saying to the judge i want this um and like suppression motions are always because the government did this terrible thing and you know dismissal motions are always because well you know this indictment isn't even for a crime what are we even doing here and you know, the, sometimes they will put attachments at the end of that to try to make their case even stronger. And like those are always those are always good because those give you a peek behind the curtain. Um, generally, anytime the judge takes the time to issue an order uh, or especially a memorandum order or an opinion, uh, those are going to be interesting because that'll be a slightly more dispassionate version of what's up in this case. Like scheduling orders aren't that great. Um, but in general, if you're really interested in a case, my advice is kind of to read everything. Like if, if you open a document and you've done it a little bit, you can tell pretty quickly whether this is worth continuing to read, like in the first two pages. Um, but every once in a while, I mean, you'll open something that's just a scheduling motion and find there's like, oh my God, allegations about what the government's doing or, or somebody else. And there's kind of no substitute for that. But if you're just trying to get like a high level, you know, read the read the charging or initiating documents, read the affidavit, look to see what the outcome is, look to see if there's weird delays on the docket, uh, look for plea agreements um, or statements of the offense or, you know, something that resolves the case. Um, 
it used to be a game to look for what's not in there. So if you pull up a, let me see if I can pull up a docket. So dockets get numbered. Uh, and generally you get a number when there's a document associated with something. And you can see like one, seven's here kind of out of order, that's weird. Um, then one, three, four, five, six, seven, like where's two? Uh, and occasionally you'll be reading a case and be like, where's 20 through 30? That also is a clue that something is up in this case that you don't know about. For folks who have not been to law school, which you know is a lot of people, um, do you have any <laughs> do you have any tips just on general like how to how to understand legalese or how to go about you know they're running into things that are confusing? Um, I mean the the best is always find somebody who does and just gut check yourself. But I'll tell you the one mistake I see a lot is the the pleading standard, the you know, the idea that somebody makes an allegation in court and it doesn't mean it's true. And then occasionally the judge will repeat the allegation uh, because they're early on in the case, before you've had a chance to bring in evidence, before you've had a chance to, you know, really put the put the facts before anybody, there's gonna be disputes about what the law is. Uh, and in that entire phase of litigation, the judge is required to take everything you, the plaintiff, said as true. I mean, unless it's just absolutely crazy nonsense, the judge is required to take it as true. And the judge will therefore say, like, agent so-and-so shot so-and-so in the behind while he was running away and doing what, and, then, and, and even nonetheless, you know, that would not violate his Fourth Amendment rights. Like, that's the judge reciting the allegations, not, finding that the allegations are true. Uh, and I, I do see people get into trouble conflating those things and it's not super intuitive. Um, but in general, like the federal criminal system is massively complicated. Um, the other one that makes lawyers crazy is DOJ will send out these things that say so-and-so pleaded guilty, he faces up to 30 years in prison. Like he does not, <laughs> like just doesn't. Um, and it's misleading to tell people that he does because people get sentenced in the guideline ranges and the guideline ranges are small and if you're a first-time offender you know you're not looking at very much um but i think the advice i'd give would just be to be cautious about what you're reading and to try to come up come away with an understanding of what it is the thing you're reading is trying to do Right, like what? What is the question that's being answered, um, and not go too far beyond that? Uh, I cover Congress, so it's been a lot of January six yeah. stuff. And a question I always get is, well, you know, Steve Bannon, he's been charged being contempt of Congress. What you know, what could happen to him, or you know, what could happen to Trump if this law that the January six committee says that he may have broken. You know what? What is the penalty? So, I mean, based on what you just said, is your advice to kind of just steer clear of that because it's such a gray area? Or, I mean, I would try not to touch it okay. because my my inclination is not to speculate as to any particular person's criminal liability, right? Like, it just seems super fraught. And if you write it and say like, well, he's charged with this, and the penalty goes up to twenty years in prison, what's your, what headlines are you going to put on there? Right. Faces twenty years in prison. Um, because, but but it's not right, and you can't, you know, an experienced criminal defense lawyer who does white collar work in D.C. could probably give you a ballpark of, you know, if a person with no criminal history points gets convicted of this offense, and, you know, what would the guideline calculation be? What would the likely range be for his sentence? But also, that, that offense is totally, like, sui generis almost like nobody nobody's been convicted of that in right. decades so it's not like it's not like a drug charge where you can look and say people with a pound of meth tend to get like between here and here um and the same thing with trump and also i saw a story where somebody said, it might have been Bloomberg, i forget where it was like obstructing an official proceeding carries you know up to 20 years or something Right, but like every J6 defendant has an obstruction right. charge and they're not getting 20 years. 
Um, and you know, no, nobody gets the statutory maximum. Like John Gotti, like KSM would maybe get the statutory maximum, but like you got to be somebody pretty special. And um, I just think it's really tricky. And also the like the committee's filing. I didn't actually read it where they say we've got evidence of this crime, but man, that's like, that's tough because the, the filing is not for the purpose of convicting somebody of a crime. It's not talking about the quantum of evidence that they have and like any possible defenses to it. And, you know, the, those issues just get super complicated to try to, to guess about. So if, if somebody comes to me and says, like, we should do a story about did so and so commit a crime? Like, no, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, because we're not really situated to know. We don't know all the facts, um, I, you know, and at best, the laws are tricky. You know, the, the federal criminal laws are really tricky because a lot turn on state of mind. Like, what did you intend to do and how do you prove what somebody intended to do at this moment? And if he intended to do this slightly different thing, then it's not a crime at all. Uh, so I'd beware. Yeah. Brad, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming. Well, my pleasure.